So folks, uh, for the last six or so weeks, we have been looking at the whole subject of generosity, focusing on the Gospel of Luke. And we've been saying that generosity is more than just giving our money away, although it includes that, that it is to be generous in every currency of our life. We have spoken about relational generosity, what it means to forgive one another, not to harbor grudges. We've spoken about generosity in terms of hospitality, of inviting strangers into our homes and sharing our possessions with one another. We've spoken about generosity without time, as it is devoted towards ministry and mission. And we've spoken over the last couple of weeks about generosity of our wealth. This morning, we're going to be looking at a story that is so familiar to us, and yet a story that beautifully sums up the entire theme that we have been looking at. This account, other than the resurrection, is the only miracle that, that appears in all four Gospels. We could, in fact, read it from the Gospel of Luke, as we have been doing over these last number of weeks. But just because there's added detail in John's account, we're going to read it from John's Gospel, chapter 6. So if you can please turn... To John chapter 6, and we're going to read the first 14 verses. Can I just say, if you don't have notes, you can get them. The stewards can please hand them out if there are any. Uh, if you can just raise your hand and they'll get them to you, otherwise we might have run out. So, John chapter 6, let's begin reading from verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish fastover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to just have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had, had eaten. And after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen. So let's bow in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you again for your word to us. We thank you for this amazing miracle, one that we've probably heard a hundred times over. We ask that somehow this morning that you would just speak in a different way through these words. And that we'll be challenged in this whole area of generosity. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I just 
thought as I was going through the series, and as I've mentioned before, most of the series was based on the writing of Tim Keller, that this week I would deviate and focus specifically on this account given in John's Gospel. Because for me, there's no story that so beautifully sums up what it is to be generous and what God can do with those who are generous. The account of this miracle is to teach us God's principle in impossibilities. How we react to any difficulty, any crisis, any situation in our lives is determined by two things. Either we will try to solve the problem we face in our own strength, or we'll hand it over to God so that He can be Lord in that situation. We can learn three things from the life of Jesus. And if we are ever get a count for God, these must be developed in our lives too. Firstly, Christ was totally submitted to the Father. In whatever situation He was placed, it was by divine direction of His Father. Secondly, He never relied on His own ability. So that is astounding when you think about it because Jesus was the Son of God. He could do anything. And yet, He never did anything on His own. John 5.19 says, Jesus gave them this answer. Verily, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Through His desire to please His Father, Jesus never acted unless He was being acted through. The reason for the record of these miracles, friends, is to show us the necessity of letting Jesus act in and through us to meet the needs around us. When I choose to handle the situation myself, I then doubt Christ's ability to act in and through me. He must be Lord of all, otherwise He's not Lord at all. He must be Lord of all, or He will not be Lord at all. So He never, He always submitted to His Father, He never relied on His own ability, and thirdly, He was a man of faith. Abandoned to the promise, Jesus always acted as though it were possible, even when it seemed impossible. And these are the lessons that we need to learn. To always submit ourselves to our Heavenly Father, to not rely on our own ability, but only on Him, and to be people of faith. So let's look at the story, and I'm going to do it in classic Methodist style of having three points. The first point is a perplexing problem. A perplexing problem. So Jesus goes to the Sea of Galilee with a great multitude following Him. But notice why they are following Him. They are following him because they saw the miracles that he had performed among the sick. I truly believe the reason why there are so few disciples in the church today is that people are looking for a miracle rather than looking for the Master. The multitude in this passage we're following Jesus out of curiosity, trying to see the next big thing, the next big miracle. They were not following Him because they loved Him and wanted to be His disciple. In fact, when He spoke about the cost of disciples, we read very clearly in Scripture that many found His teaching hard and no longer followed Him. And so Jesus takes His disciples. He retreats to a mountain and He sits down with them. 
a situation develops. And Jesus sees this as an opportunity to teach his disciples. A great company of 5,000 men are waiting to be fed. And if there were 5,000 men there, it implies if they were there with their families, there could have been up to 15 or 20,000 people in this community. But nothing had been provided for them for the lunch. Of course, just like we saw in that clip, our first reaction to that kind of situation would be the same as the disciples, impossible. How can we feed so many people with just five loaves and two fish? How are we going to solve this problem? And the lesson is simply this, friends. It is not your place to work out the how. It is your place to yield everything to the Lord, Jesus Christ, and let Him accomplish the how. The most vital lesson of this miracle is we will learn to recognize the all-sufficiency of Jesus or will we rather resort to our organized meetings and committees and man-made understanding and logic to try and figure it all out. The choice is up to us. We must, be, we must learn to be committed to Jesus by faith and thank Him already for what He has done. He is the answer. He always holds the key. A perplexing problem. How do we feed so many people? And let's be honest, that same perplexing problem is one that faces everyone who wants to do ministry or mission. Because around us, there are millions of people who are poor, millions of people who are sick, millions of people who are HIV infected, and so on. And what we can so easily say is, it is impossible. There's nothing that we can do through an organization like Ransom to meet all the needs that are around us. There are too many people. There are too many teachers needing to be trained in order to erect schools for children to be taught. It's impossible. We can't do it. A perplexing problem. Not much different from the one we have here. Which leads us to the second point, which is a paralyzed personnel. Jesus turns to Philip and he asks, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Notice he does not say, shall we buy bread? Why does Jesus ask this question? Well, the answer is given in Scripture. He asks the question to test Philip. To see if he would trust God for the provision of food. Don't for a minute think that Jesus did not know what he was going to do. We read that in John's Gospel. And he asks the question, if you will notice, even before the crowds gather. He anticipates the need. A reminder to us that Jesus always knows our need long before we ask Him. He knows your need. He just sometimes tests us and wants to know whether we will put our need in His hands or not. He places the initiative into the hands of His disciples. In the same way when He was at the the well with the Samaritan woman, he places the initiative in her hands and he asks her, do you want this living water? In the same way with the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda, he asks the man, do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well? Jesus always places the initiative back into our court. And he does it with Philip. And for this moment, Philip suddenly forgets everything he knows about Jesus. He forgets all the miracles that have already been performed. 
He forgets even Jesus' words. When what happens in our lives, friends, when we take situations into our own hands and we want to try and work things out our own way. And rather than waiting for God to respond to our prayers, we take it into our own hands and we try and do something and we make a mess of it. And then we come back to God and say, Lord, why did this happen? We see so much of ourselves in Philip. We form our little committees. We consult our experts. And so often we dare not to believe the God of the impossible. Because our God is too small. We see God in that little lunch and we say, Lord, what is this among so many? We resolve our problems using our own meager resources rather than trusting the God who is able to supply all our needs according to His riches in glory. You see, friends, unbelief restricts, limits, the resources of God. We are like that fisherman who every time he went fishing, he measured every fish he caught. And the ones that were longer than 30 centimeters, he would throw back into the lake and he only kept the smaller ones. And one day, somebody asked him, why do you do do that? Why do you throw the larger ones back into the lake? And his answer was that I only have a 30 centimeter frying pan at home. Perhaps we need to enlarge our frying pans. Who's ever heard of of the God of just enough? Who's ever heard of a God who just gives a little? We live as though Jesus taught us about the just enough life, not the abundant life. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance, but Lord, just enough is all we expect. We don't serve a God of just enough, friends. We serve a God of abundance. Amen. Amen. A God of abundance, a God who is able to supply all your needs not just some of your needs, but all your needs, according to His riches. According to His riches. You see, the word according means relative to. If I give you a blank check, I'm giving you a check according to my riches, because you can put anything in that check. If I give you out of my riches, I put a specified amount there. But God doesn't do that. He gives us a blank check. He says, I give you according to my riches because my riches are limitless. All Jesus was doing in the life of Philip was seeing whether he had reached that spiritual capacity to understand that he's a God who is able And Philip failed with a double F on his report card. And then Andrew steps forward. He seems to have found a solution. But after announcing that a small lad had a lunch of five loaves and two fish, he looks at them and suddenly unbelief grips his heart and stammering he says, but what are these among so many? What are these among so many? That was not his problem. That was Jesus' problem. How would they ever understand the all-sufficiency of Jesus until their own unbelief was revealed? Even though they'd been with Jesus for three or so years, it was hard for them still to trust his provision. And so if Philip gets a double F, Andrew just gets an F because he at least has some faith, like Mary at the wedding feast, to place the problem into Jesus' hands. Paralyzed personnel. You see, we can also be like a paralyzed personnel, friends. We can also say, well, what is my hundred rand or two hundred rand 
supporting mission in this church going to do when there's such a need, when we're talking about millions that we need for all the work that needs to be done? What can I do with this little amount? And Jesus says, place your little in the hands of the Lord and he will multiply it so that it becomes an abundance. Don't let it paralyze you. Don't not give because you think it's not going to make a difference. Don't not give of your time because you think it's not going to make a difference. You have no idea that that one little visit to that orphanage or to those people who are in need out there may just be something that will transform a child's life when they realize there are people out there who care, who love them. But we've got to put our little into the hands of the Lord. And then lastly, we see a plentiful provision. Jesus is the Lord of every circumstance in our life, friends. When we are in a situation where we come to the end of our own resources, most often we find that Jesus is there and He is all we need. When all you have left is Jesus, you realize that He's all you need. But unfortunately, we have so much that we don't always realize that. And that is why these disciples, when they saw the little, they said, Lord, this is not enough. This can't go anywhere. But eventually, they put their trust in their Lord. Here are two of Jesus' key disciples who failed. Philip the calculator, Andrew the speculator. And the Lord bypasses both of them and he goes to the little boy's lunch. What could be done with such a little lunch? They would see that the answer to their problem was there all the time. Because Jesus was the solution and he had been there all the time and they were looking past Jesus at every other possible solution. He is able. All he needed is a little lad with a little lunch putting it in the hands of the Lord and he was ready to do a miracle as he will in your life if you just place your little lunch in his hand. He has the lesson, friends. Please don't miss it. It's not so much what you possess that matters. It's whether he possesses what you possess. It's not so much what you possess, whether you earn a lot or a little. It's not so much what you possess, whether you have a little time or a lot of time, whether you have a little bit of talent or a lot of talent whether you have a little home or a big home. It doesn't matter what you possess, but that He possesses what you possess. That is the whole crux of covenant. I am not my own Lord. I am yours. Everything belongs to you. And as we surrender our meager resources to Him, He is able to multiply them and meet the needs of thousands of people, including us. Once you give your life to Jesus, you are no longer your own responsibility. You are His responsibility. As you give your children to Jesus, they become His responsibility. As you give your home to Jesus, it becomes His responsibility. Everything belongs to Him, and everything is His responsibility. How dare we try and take it out of His hands and try and solve our problems on our own. It is not our money, friends. It's not our time. It's not our gifts, our talents, our ministry, our mission. Whatever Jesus originates, He will sustain. But we must trust Him. This little lad surrendering all he had into the hands of Jesus is a beautiful demonstration of radical generosity. 
And as he surrendered it over to Jesus, he gave Jesus everything he had. And there's no doubt that he also ate that day. It wasn't that he gave it out and he never got anything in return. He got something in return. But he got far more than he bargained for in return. As we surrender our little over to Jesus, friends, the Lord is able to accomplish much. This is the secret to the generous and abundant life. And whether it be spiritual, physical, or financial, the principle is the same. God needs very little to begin with because He actually has everything. He will take any old lunch and make it do. When he needed to deliver Israel from the, the tyranny of Pharaoh, he chose a little baby called Moses. When he needed to heal a king called Naaman, in 2 Kings chapter 5, he used a little servant girl to go and tell him about Elisha the prophet who could bring healing to his leprosy. Even Elisha, a little cloud about the size of a man's fist we read in Scripture, turned on the waterworks. It is another lad by the name of David who was a young boy who was able to take the, take the giant Goliath and bring him to his knees. The principle is the same. On and on and on in Scripture we read the same thing, friends. A little in the hands of the Lord will accomplish much because we don't serve a God of just enough. We serve a God of abundance. And so the closing paragraph of the story is a picture of absolute ecstasy, of joy, delight. Andrew and Philip sit by as they watch and rejoice as this little lunch is distributed to all the people gathered. Imagine how it must have felt to see such an, such an inexhaustible supply from so little. And yet we read that when everyone was filled, the peer, what you would normally give to the servants after a meal, there were 12 baskets full. The abundant Christian life is a life of witnessing, of sharing, of giving from the overflow of what God has given to us, friends. It is a life of radical generosity, not only with our money, but it comes from the overflow of what God has given to us. Everyone was filled with plenty to spare. Is a graphic illustration of what should be the experience of every single believer. And I wonder if those little fragments of bread and fish that were left over did not become the focus of witnessing of all those people who left that picnic and on the the highways and the byways as they returned home and they went, over, went home with all the leftovers as we so often do when we come to a, 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 a bring and share lunch and we say, don't worry, you take that plate, you take the, that food. And as they went, people said, where did you get that from? And they related the miracle over and over again. What an amazing opportunity to witness to the generosity of our God. And that is what we are called to do, friends. We are called to go into the highways and byways of life and to witness to the generosity of our God, to say, God has blessed me so much and out of the overflow, I cannot help myself but bless others. That is radical generosity. Not just your money, but your time. Opening your home to strangers forgiving those who have hurt you and harmed you. Not holding on to grudges, but releasing people. Not holding them in your debt. 
giving your time to mission, giving your time to ministry, saying, Lord, I'm going to commit to giving so much to ransom, to support the mission of our church. I know it's a little, Lord, but I know, Lord, you can take my little and you can make it a lot in the hands of those who need it most. I challenge you, church, let these not just be empty words. In a moment, we get to declare those words and we get to say, I'm not my own, I'm yours. Put me to what you will. Please don't say that if you don't really mean it. Because you may just find God will put you to what he wills. And you can't then say, but Lord, this is not what I had in mind. Friends, covenant is a time for us to remind ourselves that we merely possess of what he already possesses that he is able. Let's take our little and put it into the hands of the Lord. Now you may ask, well, why have we given you a little lunch this morning? We've given you a little lunch that is symbolic of the five loaves and the two fish. I hope all of you managed to get one. And what I want us to do with that is to simply, as we come for communion a little later, is to say, Lord, I'm bringing my little, whatever that represents for you. I'm bringing my little, and I want to place it in your hands. And these baskets on these tables is rep- are representative of the hands of Jesus as he takes your little, and he promises that he will give you an abundance. Remember the verse I quoted last week. Test me in this, God says, and see if I will not open the floodgate so wide and pour so much blessing into your life that you won't be able to contain it. We take our little, we give it to God, and God will bless us abundantly with what we've given to Him. And so when we come and prepare ourselves for coming to the rail, let me just explain a few things that we're going to do. Because we're going to go into the covenant part of our service. We also get to induct our stewards and we get to ask the stewards to come forward and all those who will serve later. Folks, we're going to use a different method of communion this morning. It's called the intinction method of communion. We're going to ask two people with the bread and the juice to stand on the side of the table and you take the wafer You don't eat the wafer, you take the wafer and you dip the wafer into the cup and then you partake of the sacrament and then you return to your seat. The reason we're doing this is just because of the numbers so that we can get through it quickly but it in no way takes away from the moment that we are coming to present ourselves to God and we are thanking God for his sacrifice on that cross and we're taking our little and giving it to him. And so that is how we're going to take the sacrament this morning. Please don't eat your wafer before you get to the cup. The whole idea is to dip your wafer into the cup and partake of the sacrament. And then I also want to ask you that when we do this, please follow me very carefully so that we don't have chaos. Can those who are on the sides please come down next to the wall? Please do not come into the aisle here, but come down the aisle next to the wall. For those in the middle, can you please come down the middle? Can you please come out this way to the middle so that everybody is coming up in the same direction and everybody is returning in the same direction? Otherwise, it's going to be chaos. You all got that? Middle section, please come to the middle and return down these aisles on the side. Those on the side, please come down next to the walls and return down these aisles on the side. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder this morning that everything that we place into your hands, you can multiply and that you can feed thousands through our tiny efforts. And so we pray, Lord, that as we prepare our hearts to renew our covenant with you, to partake of these elements of bread and wine, 
that we would be reminded of the greatest gift of all that was given to us, and that what we give is such a small, small part of what we first received from you. And so we ask, Lord God, right now, open our hearts and let us respond from our hearts to all that you've given to us. Bless every person here, Lord. You know every need. May every need be satisfied in you, Jesus. We ask in your name. Amen.